Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 62, May 23rd to May 29th, 1862. Last week, we went over action at Hanover Courthouse, which gives the Union Army its best opportunity to attack Richmond. We also had action at Princeton Courthouse, turning away Jacob Cox from moving into southeastern Virginia. The Lincoln administration also passed the Homestead Act, which will be potentially opening up land in the West to settlement. This week, we will be exclusively in the Shenandoah Valley, checking in on what Stonewall Jackson is up to. Before we head to the Valley, though, I do want to mention that our most recent Patreon episode has been posted, and this is going to be a movie review, another movie review. Uh, It is the Great Locomotive Chase. This is actually going to be our second movie that stars Fess Parker. Fess Parker, of course, was Davy Crockett and Disney's Davy Crockett, Uh, and it does pair very nicely to the Great Locomotive Chase, the train robbing raid that we talked about here last month. So if that sounds like something that interests you, there is a link to the Patreon in the description. And once again, your support for the show is greatly appreciated. When last we were in the area, remember we fought the Battle of McDowell which was strange being a tactical victory for the Confederates, but seeing them lose more in terms of casualties. Milroy and Shank would withdraw back toward Fremont, whose headquarters were nearby. Now I think a lot is often put on the brilliance of Jackson and the incompetence of Union commanders in the Valley, but to get the full picture, we need to understand what the Federal plan is in the area. Fremont had some 30,000 men, but the Mountain Department was extremely vast. Given the tough task of covering eastern Kentucky, West Virginia, and even now eastern Tennessee, there was not going to be a full 30,000 men at the disposal to attack Jackson. Remember the Battle of Middle Creek? There had been a Confederate invasion of Kentucky. As we discussed, It was not a successful invasion of the state, but there still needs to be federal troops stationed in an effort to dissuade any further Confederate incursions into the eastern part of Kentucky or even the eastern part of Tennessee. Because of this dicing up of his forces, Fremont maybe had some 9,000 total that would be up for the task. In addition, remember those things called mountains were in the way between his army and the valley. Lincoln had taken over as commander-in-chief of the northern forces, if you recall, removing McClellan from those duties so he could focus on the capture of the rebel capital. Abe is an admirable president for many reasons. One is that he put effort into learning as much as he could about military strategy. It's one of the things that I think is most important for him as a president. He goes in not knowing very much about really anything that has to do with the military. Remember, he was only a volunteer in the Black Hawk War. And one of the main criticisms from the West Point officers in general is that He was not one of them, right? But he does a good job in making sure he changes that as the war progresses. Because of this willingness to learn, he's able to suggest a plan to McClellan that was not a bad idea. His direction to Fremont is not one of those shining moments, though. Lincoln would see Fremont at point A, and then Stanton at point B as being very close, with the Stanton-Parkersburg Turnpike running straight to the Confederate city. 
If Fremont was to use that road, he could potentially come in behind the Confederates, and Jackson would be caught with Banks in the north and Fremont in the south. But the Stanton Parkersburg Turnpike was not a road adequate for moving an army over mountainous terrain. This is going to play a big part in our future action. Lincoln, for the meantime, will be exasperated that Fremont was not making more progress. The slow-moving Army of the Mountain District, though, was probably doing all it was able to do in order to get into position. Banks, on the other hand, was getting sapped of his full strength. Troops were going to be pulled from his command and shifted to McDowell. An entire division under James Shields was on its way there. These men had been involved in the repulse of Jackson at Kernstown just a few weeks prior. They were going to be added to McDowell's force, who was soon to be on its way to joining McClellan in the final assault on Richmond. Not to spoil anything, but they are going to get to McDowell just in time to turn right around. But in the meantime, Banks is at a disadvantage. Jackson, on the other hand, has additional troops under Richard Ewell. Ewell has been sitting just on the other side of the mountains in central Virginia. Robert E. Lee understands the importance of putting pressure on the Union troops so that they could remove the focus solely on Richmond. It's kind of like in Lord of the Rings, when they want to have the Eye of Sauron move to the Black Gate instead of around Mount Doom. And there is where I owe an apology. Number one, I apologize if you have not read the books or have seen the movies, but number two... I apologize that we are 62 episodes in, and this is just my first Lord of the Rings analogy. It is with deep, deep sorrow that I say, shame on me. Anyway, Joseph E. Johnson was not a fan of Ewell being where he was, supporting Jackson. In fact, Johnson was ordering Ewell to withdraw back to the city, thus making his orders conflicting. Ewell is a loyal officer, though, and he finds a kind of connection with Jackson. Lee, working on the back end, will make sure that he stays where he is, and then eventually joins Jackson in his next moves. I know I mentioned this here in one of these previous episodes, but I often think it is overlooked Robert E. Lee as this administrator at least in the brief amount of time that he's serving in this role, we think of him more as a battlefield leader and events are going to show here during the war. That is probably the way that we should see him, but he does play a big part in the defense of Richmond during the Peninsula campaign uh, prior to taking over as the army commander. So he's kind of pulling strings here on the back end to make sure that this strategy is pulled off. Now, there is a lot of faith that he puts in Stonewall Jackson in this plan, and it's sort of a gamble that pays off, as we will see. Ewell has under his command several officers we need to introduce, Richard Taylor, Isaac Tremble, and Arnold Elsey. Richard Taylor was the son of former President Zachary Taylor, and was therefore also the former brother-in-law to Jefferson Davis. He had seen some action in the Mexican War on the staff of his father. Taylor had already served as Colonel of the 9th Louisiana at First Manassas, and was therefore a combat veteran. He is going to run into Nathaniel Banks again during the Red River Campaign in the Trans-Mississippi. Isaac Trimble was born in Virginia, but would claim Maryland as his adoptive state. 
In fact, the West Pointer and former engineer would be useful in helping to damage the railroad bridges in Baltimore, if you recall, around the times of the Baltimore riots. Trimble would be wounded at 2nd Manassas, but return to participate in Pickett's Charge, where he will be captured by the Union forces. Elsie was also a Maryland native who had attended West Point and served in the Seminole Wars. He would go on to hold various posts in the defense of Richmond and chief of artillery for the Army of Tennessee before the end of the war. Needless to say, Jackson is getting some experienced officers to add to his army of the Shenandoah. Now, we need to refer to a map to realize the situation fully. Front Royal is situated a little south and east of Winchester. While not exactly a metropolis, it is in a location where the north and south forks of the Shenandoah River split. Additionally, it is very close to the tourist trap Loray Caverns. Mountains do separate that area from the rest of the valley. Essentially, this meant that Jackson could move his men up through Loray without being detected by Banks at Winchester. Importantly though, Banks had been moving his men south, probing for Jackson, and perhaps being part of the overall plan to combine with Fremont and catch the rebels in a pincer move. Front Royal was lightly defended, housing men of the 1st Maryland, numbered some 700 or so. Cavalry and artillery support probably added to the Federals, to a little over 1,000. This was not a super strategic location though, as we have mentioned. It served more as a station between Winchester and Manassas, which is not too far either. Why did Jackson then decide to strike Front Royal? There are multiple reasons. First, his army could easily overwhelm the smaller northern contingent. Jackson loves to use this strategy. He likes to have his overwhelming numbers defeat smaller portions of the enemy. Second, if Front Royal fell, he could move in behind Banks and cut off his retreat farther north to Winchester. Men under Ewell would be leading the way in the form of the 1st Maryland Confederate, followed by Taylor's brigade of mostly Louisiana troops. On May 23, 1862, the Confederate 1st Maryland would make contact with skirmishers of the Union 1st Maryland Regiment. Colonel John Kinley would be the Federal commander in the area. Despite the odds pretty well stacked against him, he does a good job. Realizing the precarious situation he was in, Kinley would withdraw out of Front Royal and move to high ground deploying artillery to check the Confederate infantry advance. Along with the 1st Maryland, Wheat's Tigers would be in hot pursuit. You of course remember Roberto Wheat from 1st Manassas. Artillery and infantry fire would hold off the Confederates for a couple of hours, but Taylor would push his men to flank the Union position. Richard Taylor does have an account of the battle, and in a pretty, maybe comical scenario here, he actually advances his horse to a position where the Union troops open up on him, and in an effort to make sure that his men keep their nerves, he lets his horse drink out of the stream instead of kicking it away and trying to escape, obviously, the incoming enemy fire. He does also have a pretty good description of the assault where they actually use a railroad bridge to move across and get into a position where they can attack the Union forces that are on the high ground. In addition, Jackson had sent the 6th and 7th Virginia Cavalry on ahead as part of the advance party 
Mounted troops were reported to have worked their way in behind the smaller northern force. Taylor had been able to be supported via artillery, sent up to provide cover and neutralize the Union pieces. Coming to the conclusion that he was being surrounded, Kenley would try to move his men farther north to make a stand. While withdrawing, the 6th Virginia Cavalry would crash into the rear of the Federals. Kenley was actually wounded via a saber strike and originally presumed to have been killed by the blow. Some 690 of the Union soldiers had been captured, and they sustained 82 casualties as opposed to a reported 36 from Jackson. I think that a very important outcome of the small battle of Front Royal comes in the reports given by John Geary. Geary was a former territorial governor of Kansas and actually was mentioned in our first Patreon episode reviewing the movie The Jayhawkers. Was he potentially depicted in that movie, and was it accurate? You might just have to watch and then listen to the Patreon feed to find out. Anyway, Gary will be at Manassas, and following the defeat at Front Royal, will start to foot larger numbers of reported enemy troops in the area. In fact, he said there were 17,000 men alone at Front Royal, and probably more to come. This, as you could imagine, did not go over well with the Lincoln administration. Obviously, it was a huge bummer for George B. McClellan. He had just received the okay to get additional troops in the form of McDowell's men. If Front Royal put the nail on the board, what happens next will drive it home. Banks had received the unhappy news that Kenley's force had mostly been captured by the few survivors that streamed back to his advanced location at Strasburg. Strasburg is a few miles south of Winchester. The next location north was Middletown. Jackson had surmised that the best way to block off Banks was to hit Middletown and cut off his retreat. Banks, on the other hand, was still thinking that Jackson, with the main body of the Confederate Army, was in the front of him. He did not realize that Jackson had joined with Ewell and gone around the Massanutten Mountain, a good screen for his move. Estimates from Banks had Ewell close to 5,000 men. Still, this 5,000 almost equaled his now 6,500. If they were to get into his rear, say at Middletown, this would be a problem. On May 24th, the Federals would begin with their withdrawal. In an effort to protect his wagons, Banks would move them to the front of the column, something that would prove a bad mistake. It should be noted, though, that with Civil War armies, this is often a common practice, although it is a practice where you know that your enemy is in the rear of you, right? Like you don't put your supply wagons in a position where they could be flanked like Banks does. Two routes would be taken by the Union forces with some swinging to the west and then north. The Valley Pike, which should have been familiar to the Stonewall Brigade, running through the old Kernstown battlefield was the second route. It would be here that the rebels would strike. Cavalry under George H. Stewart, as well as the 1st Maryland, would capture elements of the wagon train, taking some 70 or so prisoners. Skirmishing would begin between the two sides, with at one point there being zwab on zwab action between Collis' zwabs and Wheat's tigers. Efforts to burn bridges and impede the advancing southerners were in vain, in their flight, the Union Army would have abandoned their wagons and leave stores on the side of the road. This is where the famous Commissary Banks quote come from, as the rebel soldiers help themselves to the discarded supplies. It should be noted that Turner Ashby and his cavalry were in the front of the line when it came to plunder. As the 24th came to a close, 
Jackson had his 16,000-man army into position for an assault the next day. Banks would call a council of war with his two brigade commanders. The writing was kind of on the wall at this point. Outnumbered, the logical decision would be to retreat, but it was resolved to put up a fight first. To the west was placed the brigade under George Henry Gordon, and to the east was the brigade under Dudley Donnelly. Jackson would waste very little time on the 25th, attacking at dawn. Ewell would put pressure on Donnelly, while Winder, Campbell, and Tolliver would assault the positions of Gordon. After a brief artillery duel between the two sides, the Confederates would begin their final push. Eventually, the weight of numbers would win the day. Taylor's brigade had been moved into a position that not only would flank Gordon, but also would potentially cut off the retreat. First Winchester was over by roughly 9.30 a.m. as Federals streamed north. Jackson's men, the famous foot cavalry, were tired at their strenuous marching, so they would be unable to capitalize on the advantage. Now you might be thinking that this is where cavalry would come in handy, right? Well, Ashby is not in a position to finish the job on Banks, which would lead Jackson to become even more frustrated with his already frustrating cavalry commander. Ashby had said his men were to the east, cutting off the potential federal route of escape there. It was also reported that they were, in fact, still collecting booty from the enemy wagons, though. Because of this lapse, Banks would take his men all the way back to Maryland. It is a big what-if of the Valley Campaign if Jackson is able to completely annihilate Banks. As it was, the Union suffered 2,000 casualties, mostly captured or missing, compared to the 400 of the Confederates. Lincoln and Stanton would now have to recall troops meant for McClellan and push them back into the valley. It is important, though, to note that Banks is going to be able to reform, and eventually they're actually going to occupy Winchester once again. So while it is a big victory for Jackson, a big victory for the Confederates, it is also going to eventually unravel when Jackson leaves the valley. I do want to take a little time today to talk about Jackson and maybe mention his habits with his officers. It is well documented that Jackson was awkward, even into adulthood. At West Point, he would perform weird exercises, like throwing his arm up in the air randomly because he thought it would be shorter than the other and this exercise was to fix it. As an officer, it was hard for Jackson to make friends, and he had very few intimates. Because of this lack of being able to really interact with adults, Jackson does seem to make better friends with children, as is depicted in the movie Gods and Generals. We have another great example of this kind of odd behavior when he rides throughout the night and waits outside of Lee's headquarters around Richmond. It is not until D.H. Hill arrives that he actually enters the building. D.H. Hill was his brother-in-law, so he was more comfortable with him. The other officers, he didn't know, so he didn't even enter the building. The general had decided not to tell his subordinates about his overall plans in the valley, vowing not to do so following his setback at Kernstown. This would go over well, with an old soldier like Ewell, but was less than ideal for, say, A.P. Hill. Richard Taylor does paint a very nice picture of Jackson in his writings, and we get a good gist of what it was like to be his subordinate. He writes that if silence was golden, then Jackson was a bonanza, which is a great quote there. He also has several instances where Jackson will come and sit by him at a fire, maybe, 
but he'll say absolutely nothing. So imagine that. Imagine your boss just coming into your office and sitting down and just sitting there and saying maybe a sentence. It's got to be sort of a tough thing to work around, especially in a situation where there's life and death at stake. There's also another great instance where Taylor will curse at some of his troops and this so puts off Jackson that he's almost disgusted by this one moment where Taylor loses control and and curses at his men and it's just sort of comical in a situation where there's bullets there's shells flying all around and the biggest issue for you is the fact that you used a swear word Um, So that gives you another idea of sort of the the pious nature of Jackson as well, that even in this dangerous situation, that's not the most important thing. We also have a lot of great Stonewall Jackson habits that are well documented. For instance, he did like to suck on lemons. He also would sometimes wrap himself in wet sheets uh, before Sunday, and he refused pepper at times because... It, he thought that it was going to help the health of his leg. So there's a lot of weird medical practices that Jackson comes up with over the years, just to give you an idea. Jackson's brilliance in the valley often has a kind of asterisk on it. Banks and Fremont were not Napoleon, and they were usually at a number disadvantage. But I do think we should put stock into the rapid movements. Jackson is able to train up his men to really become the foot cavalry that they're described as. These rapid movements to get to these positions where he can exploit the number advantage is impressive, I think, in and of itself. But I do want to let you be the judge. Now that we have fought Front Royal and First Winchester, we can pause for now. Jackson had accomplished his task of opening Lincoln's eyes to a potential Confederate move on the Capitol. Next week, we are going back to Richmond and are going to take a look at Joseph E. Johnson's attempt to turn the tide around the Capitol. At the end of it, we are going to put Johnson on hold, because although he does have a part to play in our stories yet to come, we need to say hello to a new commander for the Confederates in the East, His name is Bobby Lee. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening and have a great week.